Okay, so let's get started on chapter 13, all about different states of matter. So section one is focusing all on gases. So when we're talking about um, our different states of matter, a lot of our focus is going to be on this thing called kinetic energy. And it's an energy an object has because it is in motion and all of our states of matter our atoms are moving around and they're in motion and that's because of the amount of kinetic energy that's present so according to kinetic theory the particles in a gas are considered to be small hard spheres with an insignificant um, volume so they're constantly moving around and that movement is completely random Okay, there is no uniform kind of set of movement they're going through. They're just kind of flying around. The collisions between those particles um, are perfectly elastic as well. Okay, and so there are three uh, main characteristics uh, that these gases have. So first is that the rapid constant motion particles in a gas is going to cause them to collide with one another and with the walls of the container. So depending on where it is, they're going to be rapidly moving around. They're constantly going to be colliding into each other and into the walls. The second um, characteristic is that the gases... Um, they travel in straight line paths between collisions. So it's not like kind of like waving around, it's just straight lines. Okay? And lastly, gas is going to fill all the available space in its container. So think about when you blow up a balloon, okay? So there's more gas entering um, that elastic rubber and it's stretching it out to be able to fill as much space as the container can actually hold. Now, when we're talking about gases, we also have to talk about gas pressure. And that results from the force exerted by gas per surface area of an object. And so um, we're going to be measuring how much there is um, and actually doing calculations with that. So an empty space with no particles and no pressure is called a vacuum. But then eventually what happens is that space gets filled with the gas and then there's gas pressure now resulting. And so atmospheric pressure results from the collisions of atoms and molecules in an air or in air with objects. And you're going to use a parameter to actually measure this atmospheric pressure. And so um, moving bodies, what happens is it exerts a force when they collide with other bodies. And even though small particles in a gas is still a moving body, the force is going to be um, pretty, pretty, pretty small. Okay. However, um, when we have these small collisions, when we're having multiple uh, small collisions happening simultaneously, that's when it becomes an actual measurable force. So even though initially that small particle has a small force, um, think about all these different small forces happening all at the same time. That's when we're going to actually produce a measurable force of an object, and that becomes our atmospheric pressure. So this is our SI unit, um, and it's in Pascal's. And one standard ATM or atmosphere, these are all ways that you can actually measure gas pressure, okay? So I want you to write this, um, all of this in the notes, but this particularly, this part, one ATM equals 760 mm mercuries, and um, that also equals 101.3 kilopascals. I want you to uh, put a square around this or to highlight this um, conversion piece right there because that's going to be really really essential to you um, when we're doing our calculations. So here's an example of just converting between units of pressure and um, this is the same thing as um, conversions that we've done. Think about again you know inches to feet, hours to seconds, hours to minutes, things like that. It's the exact same thing and that's why I wanted you to kind of put this in your notes and really highlight them. So let's do this example. So a pressure gauge record records a pressure of 450 kilopascals. What is this measurement expressed in atmospheres and millimeters of mercury? So millimeters of mercury is this right here, mmHg. So we have the kilopascals. Okay, we know that one atm is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So we can do this conversion here in the same way. We start with our given, the 450 kilopascals. Since we have this unit here, we have to have the exact unit on the bottom, and we use this conversion factor. We cross out the units that are the same. We do our math. We multiply 450 by 1 and divide it by 101.3, and we're going to get 4.4 atmospheres. 
Um, our second conversion is asking for millimeters of mercury. Okay, and so we actually have to um, jump twice here. Okay, so there's two ways you can do this. This example here, they just show you um, the 101.3 kilopascals is equal to 760 millimeters mercury. If you wanted to, you can do um, the 101.3 kilopascals on the bottom, put one atmosphere at the top, then do one more set of um, conversions to put one atmosphere on the bottom equals 760 millimeters mercury. It's the exact same thing. It just shows and lays out all the units a little bit more, and so it's a little bit more organized. But if we did the math there, we would get 3,400 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so when we're talking about um, our gases moving around, when we're talking about kinetic energy, we really need to take into account temperature, okay? And so particles in a collection of atoms or molecules at a given temperature have a wide range of kinetic energies. And so it's going to vary depending on the temperature because there's so many different temperatures. And so most of the particles have kinetic energies somewhere in the middle of that range. And I'm going to show you a graph that kind of um, demonstrates this. But when we're looking at our relationship between kinetic energy and temperature, when our temperature goes up, you're going to have an increase in our average temperature. And on the opposite side, when our temperature goes down, since our particles are moving more slowly, our kinetic energy is also declining. So again, you want to think about how these particles are moving and how they're going to affect our kinetic energy. So temperature goes up. Particles are moving faster, kinetic energy goes up. Temperature goes down, particles are moving slower, kinetic energy is now decreased. Okay, so this is the example that um, of the graph that I was talking about previously. And so it shows the distribution of kinetic energies of water molecules at different temperatures. And so this blue graph right here, it shows the distribution of kinetic energies among water molecules in cold water and the red is in um, hot water. And so both of these are showing that most of the molecules have an intermediate kinetic energy. And so if you can see here in the middle, that's going to be close to the average value. And so if you notice that the higher temperature there is, the wider range of kinetic energies there are. Okay, so when we have um, higher temperatures, we actually have a wider range of kinetic energies. And so you can see how temperature is actually going to affect kinetic energy. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about with gases is this thing called absolute zero, and that is um, a temperature of zero Kelvin. Okay, and always remember that we're using Kelvins when we're talking about this. Um, distribution of kinetic energy. So anytime you see Celsius, you're going to have to change that first into Kelvin before you do any kind of calculation. So our absolute zero is when there is no kinetic um, energy. So particles are going to have no kinetic energy when we have zero degrees Kelvin. And zero, absolute zero has never been produced in a laboratory um, as of yet. Okay, so we're going to stop there and you can find the next section on the new video.